Part 15 The Hordes of Chaos Lurk Snitchdung felt peculiar. His skin was tingling. His fur was itchy. He was hungry all the time. Ever since he had been exposed to the warpstone dust during the storm, an odd sickness had convulsed him. He had taken to stealing more and more of the dwarf's supplies away, and he devoured them all in great orgies of consumption, where he simply couldn't stop himself eating until all the food was gone. He was just thankful that someone had eventually opened the hatch back into the ship before he started eating his own tail. The effects of all this consumption were starting to show. His muscles had swollen, his tail had grown thicker, and he was getting bigger. His head hurt a lot, and he found it difficult to think straight. He prayed to the horned rat that he hadn't caught some kind of plague. He remembered his fear when he had fallen sick in Nuln, and how that had almost ended his life. If the plague returned now, he had none of the herbal medicines Vilebroth Null had used to preserve his life then. Slowly, he pulled himself up the ladder to the crow's nest, so he could make his daily communion with the wretched Vankuol. He was so heartily sick of that nagging voice within his head, babbling foolish orders and telling him what to do. Part of his mind knew that he should not be thinking that way, that it was most unwise, but he couldn't bring himself to care. His body ached all over, his vision was blurring, and his fur was beginning to fall out in places where monstrous boils were erupting. He decided not to bother about contacting the Gracier. He would return to his burrow and sleep. First, though, he would need to eat. He was also starting to feel a hankering for a nice piece of plump dwarven flesh. Felix knocked on the door of Borek's cabin. The metal echoed beneath his knuckles. Come in, the dwarf said. Felix opened the door and went inside. Borek's cabin was a bit larger than his. The walls were lined with crystal-fronted cabinets containing many books. A table was bolted to the floor in the center, and on it was laid an ancient map, held in place by four strange-looking paperweights of black metal. Noticing Felix's curiosity, Borek said, They are magnets. What? Those paperweights are magnets. They stick to iron and steel. It's some odd philosophical principle, akin to the one that keeps compass needles pointing northwards. Go ahead, try to pick one up. Felix did as he was told, and felt a resistance that he had not expected. He let go of the metal, and it seemed to leap from his hand and adhere to the table with a click. It was typical of the dwarves' attention to detail, he thought, that they had managed to find a way of keeping maps in place, even on such an unstable platform as the airship. He mentioned this fact to Borek. It is a power that has been known to us for a long time. It is used by our navigators on the steamships out of Baragvar. He smiled. But I suspect you are not here to discuss the finer points of furnishing a vessel's cabin. Felix agreed that this was not, and he began to speak, telling Borek about what had happened with the sorcerer and his mention of the demon. The encounter with Mueller had made him think. For the first time, he had really begun to take seriously the dreadful possibility that such a thing might exist at Karak Doom. The old dwarf listened, nodding occasionally. When Felix was finished, there was a short silence when Borek filled his pipe. How can this be? Felix asked. How can demons exist here and not outside the wastes? Borek looked at him long and hard. They can and do exist outside of the wastes. According to our records, many have fought against the armies of the dwarves. Then where are they now? Vanished. Who knows why? Who can truly explain the actual workings of chaos? But surely you do have a theory. There are many theories, Herr Jaeger. As far as we know, raw magical energy flows much more strongly through the wastes. It seems most likely that demons feed on this energy and need it to exist. Beyond the wastes, they can only manifest for only a short period of time before vanishing because magic is weaker. 
Here in the realm of chaos they can manifest themselves for much longer periods because there is more power for them to draw on. Why is that? Schreiber believes there is some sort of disturbance at the very center of the wastes, which is the source of all magic. According to him, it also warps time and distance in some manner. Many scholars claim that time flows at different rates in different parts of the waste, you know. And the further you go into the waste, the more pronounced the effect becomes. Why are the fiends not swarming all over us then? Maybe because we haven't gone far enough. I doubt that it is possible for a demon to exist for long even out here, so close to the edge of the waste. But I do not know for certain that this is the case. There is a lot I do not know about these matters. But you think a demon still dwells in Karak Doom? Borek laughed grimly. It's all too possible. Even as I left, there were dire rumors that some dreaded thing had been summoned, and King Fangrim Firebeard and his rune masters marched to meet it. It may be it was trapped there, or it never left. I do not know. I and my kin escaped the city before those final battles. It is not exactly a pleasant thought. No, but it is one that we will soon know the answer to. We should reach Karak Doom within the next day or so. What then? Then we will see. Faster, quick, quick! Gracier Fankul chittered. He was tired and restless from being constantly cooped up inside the palanquin. Such confinement went against all the Skaven instincts to get up and scuttle about. But he really had no choice. For the past few days he had done nothing but use communication spells and ride relays of palanquins through the subterranean roadways of the Under Empire, stopping only long enough to change bearers and palanquins, eating all the meals as he moved on. He had blisters on his rum from sitting so long, and he felt like his back was going to be permanently curved. His bearers whined their complaints, and Fankwell considered blasting one or two apart just to make an example of them. But he knew that would be counterproductive. All he would achieve would be to slow himself down until they reached the next way station, where he could acquire another change of slaves. Still, he promised himself, once they were there, these whining lackeys would suffer. That was, if he could find a strength. The Gracier felt drained by the strain of having to expend so much power to communicate with Lurk over so long a distance. And now the buffoon was not even answering to his calls. It was so frustrating. He had no idea what had happened. Was Lurk dead? Had the airship crashed in some hideous accident? Was the long chase worth nothing? Surely it could not be so. But ever since he had seen that accursed Jaeger, Fankwall felt a sinking feeling. Where the human and the wretched dwarf companion were concerned, Fankwall was always prepared for the worst. The two of them seemed to have been born specifically to thwart him. He cursed the engineers of Clan Skariri. Why couldn't they bend their accursed ingenuity to build some improved means of transportation through the tunnels of the Under Empire? Surely they could think of something more effective than simple relays of slayborn litters. Did they always have to spend their days working out bigger and better weapons? Why not warpstone-powered chariots or traction engines? Fankul wondered. Or some kind of long-range version of the Doom Wheel? Surely such things could not be beyond them. If he remembered, he would mention the idea to the Council of Thirteen in the next report. Faster, quick, go, go! He urged his throat hoarse. He needed to get to the Northlands soon, he knew, and find out what had happened to that wonderful airship. If only he could get his paws on that, he would never again lack for swift transportation. And once he got there, he vowed, someone was really gonna pay for the discomfort he had endured. Felix lay on the bed in his cabin, staring at a metal ceiling. His head was spinning with all the things he had learned this day concerning the realm of chaos. The world was a great deal more complex than he would have ever thought possible, and it was increasingly obvious to him that his own people still had a lot to learn from the elder races. 
He closed his eyes, but sleep would not come. He felt tired, but also restless. His shoulders still pained him, despite the healing salves which Varek had applied. He knew that that area was going to be tender for a long time to come. Still, the mail had been repaired by one of Mackaison's apprentices, and it looked even better than new. Cursing his lot, he rose from the bed and pulled on his boots. Leaving the chamber, he walked to the airship's rear observation turret. The rearmost bubble of the turret was small, and housed an organ gun mounted on a swivel platform. Felix slumped down into the seat and worked the foot pedals that sent it turning first to the left and then to the right. He found this motion oddly relaxing, reminiscent of swinging in a hammock or being in his grandfather's rocking chair. He reached up and grasped the handles of the organ gun. This was another of McKyson's unusual designs. It had grips like a pistol and was fired by pulling a trigger. The entire mechanism of the gun was balanced on a gimbal and could be swiveled up or down, left or right, almost without any effort. Felix did not know what the dwarves expected to attack them flying at such a high altitude, but they were obviously taking no chances. He gazed out over the land over which they were passing. The sky had darkened into some semblance of night. At least the clouds were darker above them, and there was no suggestion of a sun above. Felix wondered about that. They had reached an area where it seemed no matter how high they climbed, the sky was always obscured. He had decided that it was either some form of potent magic, or simply that somewhere in the distance, great masses of warpstone dust were being thrown high into the air and driven upwards by powerful winds. The only illumination came from huge fire pits set in the rough terrain below, craters resembling the bubbling mouths of volcanoes around whose glowing openings twisted figures capered. As the airship passed over the fire pits, it shuddered slightly, caused by the rising current of warm air. This didn't frighten Felix as it once had. He had come to find the gentle turbulence rather soothing. It was strange. The more he flew, the more he had come to regard the sky as being something akin to the sea. The winds were currents, and the clouds something like the waves. He wondered if the sea, too, had currents at different levels the way the winds appeared to move at different speeds at different heights. There was much here for a philosopher to study, he thought, yawning, and slipped gently into sleep. Lurk pulled himself slowly and stealthily down the corridors of the ship. The hunger in his stomach was like a living creature clawing and trying to escape. It caused him actual physical pain. Ahead of him, he sensed prey. It didn't have the scent of dwarf, but of human. Lurk didn't care. He simply wanted to feel red-hot blood gushing into his mouth and gorge on chunks of raw, warm meat, and a human would suit those purposes just as well as a dwarf. He entered the rear chamber and heard the snorings of the figure in front of him. Good. His foolish prey was completely unaware lost in a swinish slumber, the like of which no skaven would ever allow himself to fall into, even if there were no obvious threats of danger. The human's blonde furred head was thrown back, and his neck was bared, as if inviting the fangs of Lurk. Saliva filled his mouth at the prospect of fresh meat. All it would take would be one bite to sever the artery. He would lock his jaws on the human's neck to smother the screams. Another few paces, and he would be in a position to strike. Suddenly, Lurk heard footsteps on the ladder leading down from the deck above. Someone was coming. He cursed quietly, knowing that if he attacked now, he would be discovered before he could consume the prey, and that the alarm would be given. Some spark of self-preservation buried deep in his mind told him that this would not be a good idea and then he padded swiftly back down the corridor, returning the way he had come. Felix suddenly awoke at the sound of weary footsteps on the ladder. He was glad to be awake, for he had been in a nightmare in which a giant rat-like creature stalked ever closer to him down a dark, misshrouded tunnel. Doubtless, it was a bad dream inspired by the beastmen he had seen today. Sigmar knew they had been monstrous enough to inspire a lifetime of nightmares. 
He looked up to see Varek lowering himself onto the observation deck. He carried his book in one hand and a pen in the other, and he looked a little disappointed to find someone else present, as if he had desired to be alone here. Good evening, Felix, he said, forcing a smile. It actually is evening. Who can tell? The dwarf shrugged. It's as good a term as any to use in this foul place. The sky is darker and the land is obscured, so I suppose it might as well be. In that case, good evening, Varek. I came here to write up my notes. It is difficult to do when you're sharing a cabin with Godric and Snorri. I can imagine. Felix was suddenly glad that his height and the fact that he was a human had qualified him for his own cabin. It was one of the only three single rooms in the entire airship, and Borek and Mackaysen had the others. What were they doing this time? Uh, Gotrek claimed that Snorri had beaten him on a technicality in their last headbutting contest, they were having quite an argument about it. Snorri wanted to have another contest right here and now, to settle the matter, but I talked them out of it. How? Felix couldn't imagine this soft-spoken young dwarf talking the pair of troll slayers out of anything. I reminded them that it usually takes about three days for the loser to recover from a headbutting contest, and that's assuming nothing serious is broken. And if that happened, one of them would miss out on our arrival to Karak Doom. Assuming that we would arrive in time, of course. That seemed to do the trick, though. When I left them, they were having a vodka drinking contest instead. Hopefully, by the time I get back, they'll have knocked themselves unconscious. I wouldn't bet on that, Felix said. Varek smiled sadly. No, nor would I. Don't mind me, said Felix. I was just taking a nap. He made to settle back once again. Uh, before you do, could I ask you to go over all the details of today's events? I want to make sure I get all things right. Of course, Felix said, and began to go over the story once again, with only slight exaggerations. Felix woke later, still in the gunnery chair of the organ gun, to find one of the engineers sweeping the decks around him. Yawning and stretching, he pulled himself upright and decided to go get some breakfast. As he rose, he noticed that there was a small band of mounted warriors directly below them, apparently riding in the same direction as the airship was flying. Are they following us? he asked, knowing it was a foolish question even as he asked it. While he was watching, the black-armored riders had fallen far behind the swiftly moving airship. No, replied the dwarf, but something is surely up. All morning we've been passing over warbands moving in the same direction. It's almost as if they know where we're going and are moving to intercept us. That is impossible, said Felix, but in his heart he was not certain. After all, who knew what the forces of chaos were really capable of? It's getting worse, Varek said, continuing to focus the telescope out the window of the command deck. Now there seem to be more of them ahead of us than there are behind us. Felix was forced to agree. Even with his naked eye, it was very obvious. All day, they had been passing over bands of beastmen, chaos warriors, and other wicked creatures. The further they traveled, the more frequent the sightings became. And all of the followers of darkness were streaming in the same direction as the airship. It was as if a secret signal had been given and an army was being gathered. I don't like this at all, said Felix. Can they really know what we're doing? Are they waiting for us? I don't think that is very likely, Borek said a bit testily. He had slumped back into one of the padded leather comanches and sat there, stroking his beard meditatively with the fingers of one gnarled hand. There could be no way they are aware of our coming. We have no traitors aboard this ship. No one could have known our plans until we set out. And even if they did, they surely could not have sent word faster than we actually traveled. 
The old dwarf was sounding as if he was trying to convince himself. Felix had no difficulty finding flaws in any of his arguments. Schreiber had known about their goal, as had Stragov and any number of his followers. Sorcery could transmit a message even faster than the airship could fly. More simply still, maybe the Chaos followers had visionaries in their own ranks who could actually foresee the future. It sometimes appalled even Felix on how quickly and easily he could find the dark side of things. And we're assuming that they are concerned with us, Borek continued. There is no proof of that either. Maybe they have their own reasons for gathering along this route. And what could those be? I don't know, but I'm sure that if it's the case, we will find out soon enough. As the airship flew on, the warbands became larger, as many of the smaller mobs of Chaos worshippers met and banded together to form larger units. In some bands, up to a dozen banners could be seen fluttering in the wind. Grotesque creatures were becoming more common among the creatures below. Felix saw strange warriors, part man, part woman, with enormous crab-like claws. They were mounted on loping two-legged creatures with long protruding tongues. As he watched from the telescope from high above, this troop of demonic cavalry chased down a scattered band of mutants. Their foul steeds shot out their long sticky tongues, grasped their victims and reeled them into their masters, or mistresses, claws the way certain jungle lizards were supposed to catch flies. Odd, brightly colored creatures whose hideously exaggerated faces appeared to emerge directly from the middle of their torsos capered through the bright desert sands. They waved up at a passing airship as if greeting a long-lost friend, and then clutched their sides, rolling around in insane demonic mirth. One enormous black-armored rider led a pack of twisted hounds across the rocks. The animals had reptilian crests, and their skins glowed a bright metallic red. At times, Felix felt like he was looking down into scenes dragged from some madman's nightmare, but all the same he couldn't stop himself from watching. Ahead of them, a range of hills rose out of the desert. As they approached, Felix saw that the foothills were mere outriders of a much larger range of towering peaks, tall as anything in the world's edge mountains. The hills shimmered with unnatural color, and for the first time Felix saw something in the waste that resembled vegetation. A forest of monstrous slimy fungi bloomed on the hillsides. Each of the mighty mushrooms was as big as the tallest tree, and its canopy was huge enough to shelter an entire village. Each one was a slightly different sickly shade, jaundiced yellow, bone white, nausea green, and each rose towards the sky as if fighting with its fellows for every scrap of light and every inch of space. Some of the fungi had multiple caps, each branching from a central stalk. A vile mucus enshrouded the flesh of the fungal trees and dripped poisonously onto the ground below. All suggested something unnatural and evil, a life that should not exist in any sane world. Here and there, the mighty fungal trees had fallen, or deliberately felled, and beastmen and mutants crawled all over them, like ants on a rotting log. After they ate it, they shouted and fought and engaged in orgies of unspeakable activities as if the dead thing's substance contained some kind of intoxicating drug. As the hills rose before Felix's rapt gaze, they became cleaner and devoid of the unnatural vegetation. Instead, more ruins became evident. He spied small forts made from little more than accumulated boulders, intricately carved castles with walls shod in steel and brass, and palaces carved from the living rock of the hills. There was no rhyme or reason to it. Near every structure lay skeletons and unburied corpses, or gallows from which dangled hanged beastmen. The smell of burning and death rose from the hillside. This was an area which had obviously seen a lot of fighting, but was now deserted, and as they flew on, it became obvious why. Over the hills, warriors moved en masse, flowing like a turbulent stream down into the roads which passed through the valleys, 
joining the torrent of chaos worshippers who traveled on the dusty roads. They hopped, they flopped obscenely, but they all moved, and they all had one destination in mind. There could be no doubt now that all the worshippers of chaos were heading in the same direction that they themselves were heading to, the distant mountains. Hours went by. The airship passed over a flat plain in the shadows of the hills, and still the endless flow moved beneath them. In the center of the plain, Felix could see that four enormous boulders had been carved into monstrous parodies of the human form. At first, he had thought it was a trick of the light, a mirage brought on by the odd shape of the rocks and his own tired eyes. But after a while, he realized that this was not the case. Each of the mighty stones really had been carved into the shape of what he assumed to be one of the four gods of chaos. As he came closer, he began to get some idea of the scale of these monumental statues. Each one was loftier than the mooring mast at a lonely tower. He had heard that some of the peaks on the elves' islands of Ulfuan had been carved into some enormous statues, but this was work which surely must dwarf even that. Some awesome magic had been used to shape the very bones of the earth into these mocking images. And, in a moment of wonder and terror, Felix came to some understanding of the true might of the powers of chaos. One of the statues was a huge squatting thing, its sides blotched with boils and cankers. Its leering image spoke of a million years of pestilence and death. Somewhere in the back of his mind, a voice whispered to Felix that this was Nurgle, the demon god of plague. Another was shaped into something bird-headed, with enormous wings enfolded around its body. Eerie and unnatural light played around the head, a crown of mystical energy that transmitted the thought that this was an object sacred to Tsinge, the architect of fate and the changer of ways. The third statue was carved in the shape of a creature not quite man and not quite woman, posing in an attitude both lascivious and mocking. Huge caves made blank empty eye sockets. Felix shivered, for somehow he knew that this was a depiction of one of the many aspects of Slanesh, the lord of unspeakable pleasures. He had encountered the demon god's worshippers before many times in the past. The last one was the shape of a massive warrior, bat-winged, armed with sword and whip, face masked by a helmet obscuring all features. There was something in the stance that suggested a creature at once shambling and ape-like, but possessed of enormous physical power. This must be Korn, the blood god, lord of the throne of skulls. Felix shivered. The name of Korn was a name which had inspired terror since the dawn of time. Around the feet of these titanic effigies, a few worshippers prostrated themselves and threw down offerings, but most simply saluted and moved on. Felix had given up on any attempt to count the chaos worshippers. They numbered in the thousands now. It was like watching an army of ants on the march, and the motives of the horde seemed just as incomprehensible and just as threatening. He was only glad that they were marching away from the lands of men, deeper into the wastes, Although he realized that it would take only one order to turn this great army around and send it scything southwards, if a powerful enough leader was to arise. The command deck behind Felix was silent, apart from the throb of the engines, and Felix knew that all the dwarves present were thinking the same thing as he was. All of them had been overcome by the terrible majesty of the army gathered below them. The foothills climbed beneath them, and now, ahead of the airship, loomed the true peaks of the range. Beneath them, the land looked almost normal, with streams and trees, and what might have been goats leaping along the ridges. Was it possible that some parts of the waste had remained untouched by the warping influence of chaos? Did some counterbalancing force still strive against its effects? Or was there some kind of trick of the dark powers? an innocuous veil drawn over a secret thing even darker and more terrible than anything they had yet witnessed. Mackaison let out his breath in a long, slow whistle, as he pulled the levers and turned the great wheel, sending the airship soaring through a long valley, which sliced between the brooding black peaks. 
he had to make constant adjustments to the controls as he fought against crosswinds and turbulence while threading a path through the winding valley. The airship turned almost 90 degrees to the right, and ahead of them lay a long veil, teeming with the followers of chaos. Wisps of smoke rose from their cooking fires to form a dark cloud that threatened to obscure their vision. Tens of thousands of beastmen looked up at them curiously. Thousands of chaos warriors were drawn up within a crazy maze of earthworks. The airship droned steadily down the valley towards the deepening darkness that filled its far end. Enormous chariots pulled by hideous mutants larger than elephants rose above the mass. Here and there some had tumbled down, some had melted, and some had been simply smashed as if by a superior force. Huge T-shaped crosses had been placed among the ranks of tents and blockhouses, and each one bore a crucified figure. Some were fresh, others had been reduced to skeletons by the carrion birds. Ahead of them loomed a singularly enormous mountain. Its huge bulk blocked the end of the valley. Its sides were covered in row upon row of broken fortifications. The ground on the mountain's lower slopes was covered by a white plain of bones. The fortifications rose to a citadel atop the mountain's very peak, and it was obvious that a battle had been fought here, and recently, for smoke still rose from burning buildings, and black-armored warriors were moving among the corpses of the recently dead. A tense silence filled the command deck of the spirit of Grungne. All the dwarves appeared to be holding their breath in amazement and terror. Eventually, Borek spoke, and his voice came out in a harsh croak. Behold, the peak of Karak Doom, he said. 